Good morning, my name's Andy Ram Gobin and I'm a Principal Technology Evangelist for Technimove. I want to say first a thank you to Giant for inviting me back to speak at another one of their events. I had the pleasure of speaking at the December event where I covered the technology landscape and focused on some key areas for cyber security um, and cyber resilience. And today's talk, I'm going to be covering a piece of content that I created for Technimove back in February which is around the periodic table for cybersecurity and cyber resilience. And one of the reasons that I wanted to create this piece of content was an educational way to talk customers through the full threat landscape, understanding the technologies that can be applied, the major cybersecurity frameworks, governance, compliance and best practice, typical types of attacks that businesses expect to be breached by, uh, looking at things like DevSecOps and moving more into CICD pipelines and, and cloud native architectures, um, and then looking at the true understanding of cyber resilience. And, and for me, there is a clear demark between cyber security technologies and cyber resilience. And cyber resilience is a, a business's ability to continue delivering business outcomes irrespective of a cyber breach. And I always talk about, you know, taking a breach will happen mindset. And there are a lot of businesses that unfortunately don't really have any kind of breach response plans or any kind of real understanding of how they would respond to a potential breach. Um, and that just causes you know, hysteria and panic when the worst does happen. So this is one of the reasons that I wanted to you know, deliver a piece of content where we could really start to consult and you know, deliver expertise around how to protect yourself um, from cyber attacks, but also to how to deliver um, you know, an executive plan around recovering from a cyber breach. And when we look at healthcare, although it's very similar to a lot of other industries, there are some fundamental areas of security that are bespoke and specifically pertinent to uh, the healthcare industry. So we look at things like the large attack surface. So you'll hear a lot of vendors talking about reducing the attack surface, and that can be done with technology. But because the threat landscape is always changing and always growing, that large attack surface is always becoming bigger and in things like healthcare you've got you know complex architectures lots of different third parties that need to integrate with each other and you also have you know a number of you know nurses staff having to share workstations and instead of using you know individual account credentials and um, for those workstations what we tend to see is lots of staff are actually sharing credentials which you know, can be quite a big security risk. Um, another big pertinent area is phishing and spear phishing. So I think most people understand what a phishing attack is. Um, that is very pertinent in today's industry and has become even more, uh, has grown even further due to the likes of Corona and people having to work during the pandemic remotely. Um, and this, this kind of leads into things like spear phishing where, you know, phishing attempts is a, a typical email that's sent with a phishing link. Um, and is there to try and encourage someone, a member of staff, to click on a particular link um, that will actually infect um, that client device with malware and allow our attacker to start executing uh, the Lockheed Martin cyber kill chain. And spear phishing is where it's targeted at a specific individual or organization. So it's more personalized, giving that user the idea that this particular email is you know, authentic. And we have another, another problem with spoofing email targets, and, and those are aimed at C-level suite executives in healthcare. And this is where the email address will actually look like it's coming from a real authenticated company. So it's very easy to spot a, a poor phishing attempt sometimes because you can look at the domain of an email and you can see quite clearly um, that it's not a reputable email address. However, if that has been spoofed, then it can mean that a user starts to look at that email as credible and they're more likely to click on a link. Uh, another big area um, for concern in healthcare around security is identity theft, which can lead to breach of data and um, which can lead to breach of HIPAA, which is one of the main compliances in terms of protecting patient data. Uh, malware and ransomware is really big, you know, cross vertical and cross industry at the moment. Um, and everyone kind of has heard about ransomware. This is where an attacker will effectively uh, breach your systems and then will encrypt your drives using something like BitLocker and then leave a crude ransom note in terms of if you want your data back, then you're going to have to pay us X amount of cryptocurrency. And this is where it leads into things like immutable backups, which I'll talk about later, which is how you can put one way of protecting against things like ransomware. 
Um, these are obviously leading to things like data breaches, which is again, very pertinent in healthcare. Um, and another big thing is insider threats. And a lot of this can come from things like social engineering. And this leads into the lack of awareness around security training for users. A lot of users aren't IT savvy. And unless they've had any kind of security awareness training, then they're more likely to click, click on things um, and dangerous phishing attacks and, 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 and compromised links effectively. Um, difficulty in managing healthcare systems. You know, healthcare is a very complex industry where you've got, again, lots of third parties, lots of medical devices that when you have to patch them or update them, they break, which causes even more problems. You know, criminals are focused on stealing patient data. And when you're looking at things like staffing models in healthcare, there are a lot of volunteers that work in the healthcare industry. And again, these volunteers aren't necessarily IT savvy. And then one of the last big areas is mergers and acquisitions. And this can cause problems across all verticals. But again, it's quite pertinent in healthcare. And where there are multiple mergers and acquisitions, there are multiple disparate IT platforms and security platforms that are integrated into one. You've got lots of different teams that are then integrated into one. And unless those are done in a logical manner um, and, and follow best practice, they can lead and open all sorts of uh, routes to potential cyber breaches. So I want to start by talking about the technology area. And this is the, the orange boxes on the periodic table. And I haven't been able to fit everything on here because I could only fit 120 elements onto this piece of content. But I'll talk through some of these. I've only got you know, a short period of time. So if anyone wants to follow up with me, they can do this by a giant. So you know, things like next generation firewalls, everyone's heard of these. They've been around for you know, tens of years now. And the typical vendors are the likes of Cisco, Palo Alto, uh, Fortinet, and Checkpoint. There are a lot of other vendors that work in these areas. Um, web application firewalls are usually there to protect against a web application and a web tier. This is obviously very pertinent in things like healthcare. And this is now moved on in the industry and the vendors are now calling it a WAP, uh, another acronym, a web application API protection. And the web application firewall, traditional firewall, used to protect against things like DDoS, so dedicated or distributed denial of service attacks. This is where effectively your web application or web tier gets flooded, almost like a letterbox where you're putting a huge amount of posts and letters through there, effectively you'll end up getting so many letters jammed in that post box that you can't actually receive clean traffic. But we've moved on quite far from there now and we're looking at things like bot mitigation, account takeover, fraud prevention, um, and now things like client side payment attacks where you know, big organized crime groups like Magecart are targeting e-commerce platforms and web tiers and trying to scrape payment credit card details from, from users. You know, we move into things like UEBA, and that's user entity behavioral analysis. And this is using things like machine learning um, and AI to do baseline detection and anomaly detection. So building a behavioral baseline for a particular user or application, understanding that baseline, and then seeing how that baseline or that user deviates. And as soon as a user or an application deviates from a known good behavior that can flag systems which can flag to your IT team which allows you know the team to gain valuable insights and to start focusing their time on what they see as suspicious activity and um, EDR is endpoint detection response and this is a well-known technology area now where we talk about things like threat hunting so traditionally your AV or antivirus would have been quite static and the things like Kaspersky, um, McAfee, uh, Symantec, Norton. But we've moved into an area now in the last four to five years of endpoint detection response. Uh, Carbon Black, owned by VMware, were the first company to really launch EDR. But we're now looking at you know, huge amounts of vendors in this area, the likes of Cisco, um, the likes of Fortinet, the likes of Sentinel-1, Silence, Cyber Reason. And there's a huge amount that can be done around threat hunting uh, and, and in a nutshell, that is around proactively looking at suspicious activities, uh, specific, suspicious malware on endpoints, and investigating those um, and being able to sandbox those and doing forensic analysis to check whether that suspicious activity should be blocked or whether it can be allowed. And we've got things like MDR and XDR that go further than a typical EDR tool. So something that a lot of businesses struggle with is that 
a lot of these platforms and technology areas deliver huge amounts of telemetry back into the business. And if you don't necessarily have the correct SOC analysts or log analysts or security analysts in your business, it can be very difficult to gain insights from those telemetry and then execute actionable intelligence. Actually, in a lot of areas, what happens is IT teams get overloaded with huge amounts of telemetry. They don't know really which way to turn and you end up having a very expensive platform that doesn't deliver a huge amount of value. So we look at things like managed detection response, which again can be delivered by a number of different vendors where they deliver, you know, 100 or 150 to 200 analysts as part of that package that will analyze all of that telemetry for you and deliver it as a fully managed service. Seam, uh, number six on the, the orange boxes, security incident event management. Seam tools have been around for years. Um, that is, a, again, a very heavyweight duty tool that brings a huge amount of log analytics and incident analytics into your environment and into your IT team to allow you to see exactly what's going into your environment. And this leads into something that Gartner uh, termed, the, termed the, the phrase SOAR, Security Orchestration Automated Response. And the two go hand in hand. So SOAR is that element of being able to automate the response based on the log analytics that you're getting back from SIEM technologies. The problem that we're having now is that the SOC, the Security Operations Center, um, which was a huge area for, for enterprises and businesses to build out many years ago, comes with a heavy cost, trying to find the experts, trying to find the security analysts that can sit in a SOC that really have the skills and understanding to be able to deliver the intelligence can be quite difficult. So what we've seen now is we've seen things shift back from your traditional SOC and then your traditional EDR, and they're somewhere meeting in the middle to an MDR type platform where you can gain a lot of intelligence, but it's fully managed and it takes a lot of that burden away from the IT team. You know, we talk about things like IAM and PAM, so that's identity access management and privilege access management. These are huge tools around identity governance and federation. You know, understanding a user is who they say they are and then understanding that what those privileges are attached to that user. And I'll talk about things like RBAC, which is 54 um, on the green section, and that's role based access controls. All of this really ties in into one. And an MFA, multi-factor authentication, ties directly into identity access management. That's another level of authentication. Here's my user, I've got my password, but instead of authenticating on just a password or a VPN, I need to have a soft token or a hard token where I can layer a second layer of authentication to again, try and ensure that the user that is authenticating is who they say they are. And there's a lot on these oranges boxes, and I, I don't have time to go through all of them, but you know, so some very pertinent ones are number 13 and number 16. You know, that's a CASB, a cloud access security broker, um, and a secure web gateway. So these protect um, at a layer um, in between a public cloud or a private cloud, and they're protecting users that are connecting to applications. You know, we have things like network access control. This is something, again, that's really pertinent to all businesses, but especially businesses like healthcare. You know, there's a lot of devices that can be on a, a network. And unless those devices are authenticating by something that we call 802.1x, uh, along with AAA security, you could have rogue endpoints connecting to your network without even knowing. So having that security baseline of being able to always know and authenticate a known device is critical to hardening your security posture. And there's some really cool stuff going on in the industry around passwordless authentication. You know, this kind of builds on the typical IAM and MFA principles, but there's a vendor out there called Hyper at the moment that are doing true passwordless authentication. So that allows you to fully authenticate into an environment without a password. You know, at number 22, we've got something called SASE. And SASE, it's a difficult one to pin down into one of these areas on the periodic table because it's based on technology, but ultimately it's an overarching governance and a framework. So it, we talk about SD-WAN, MFA and then a CASB or SWG. And really, SASE stands for Secure Access Service Edge. And in principle, it is securing the edge where users are connecting to applications. And a lot of the times, this is now public cloud environments where we've got lots of disparate users that are now we're working from remotely from home, developers that are connecting to cloud applications, and we need to secure that user journey end to end. So we've got also 
things like DLP, these are very well known in the industry and have been around for, for years, and that's data loss prevention. And that can be done in transit or at rest, and that's protecting data when it's sitting on the client side or server side, and then also protecting data um, you know, when you're looking at over, going over the WAN, which ties straight into to things like encryption. Uh, NDR, network detection response, is very similar to EDR, but it works at a network layer. And then we've got some really cool things like continuous authentication. Again, this kind of builds on the identity access management, privilege access management, MFA principles. But there are companies out there called but like Behaviosec, where they build up a behavioral biometric fingerprint of a user and they continuously authenticate that user throughout the entire life cycle of the session. So in, in terms of the way things are currently done now, a user authenticates and as soon as they authenticate, they're in, they're in on the application, they're in, in their environment and they can do as they please. Whereas continuous authentication ties back into things like UEBA and it builds up a behavioral fingerprint of the user. So if a user starts to build, they deviate from that baseline behavior or that known good behavior, that could be how long it takes them to type in their password, uh, where they move their mouse. It can immediately flag that to the IT team and then you can lock privileges straight away and that gives you the time to investigate that user to check again that they are who they say they are. So moving on from the technology side, the white section focuses on frameworks and there are a lot of acronyms you know, on this periodic table. So, you know, I'll kind of demystify what the main frameworks that you need to be focusing on. So uh, Lockheed Martin Cyber Kill Chain, I spoke about this at the last event that I spoke at, at Giant in December. Um, and this is from Lockheed Martin, and it's driven around intelligent driven defense, which is all around understanding the step chain mindset of a hacker and understanding their process from the reconnaissance phase all the way to the data exfiltration phase. Uh, MITRE ATT&CK framework, a uh, very well known repository, a global repository contributed by hundreds of thousands of people. And this really focuses on adversarial techniques, tactics, and common knowledge. So it's a repository that is contributed so that businesses can start to understand what are the typical types of attack, something like a privilege escalation, for example, and, and what are the TTPs, tactics, techniques, and procedures that an attacker a potential cyber criminal will take to try and execute a particular attack. Uh, NIST is the National Institute of Standards Technology. This is one of the ma major cybersecurity frameworks and a lot of businesses practice the NIST controls. And um, you've got things like CIS, which is critical security controls run by the Center for Internet Security. And uh, so whenever you're doing anything around infrastructure, you know, the baseline compliance is to benchmark that infrastructure against CIS framework. So we use things like Puppet, for example, to automate that benchmarking and, and having that config state management that means that you are always complying to things like CIS. And o OWASP is a huge one. Um, again, for this, but things like healthcare, um, and that's protecting your web applications. And they talk about the OWASP top 10, which is very, very well known in the industry. And it looks at the top 10 attacks that, again, attackers will use to try and breach your web application and the types of defenses and tactics that you can use to defend against those particular breaches. So then we talk about governance, compliance and best practice. And, and this is one of my favorite sections because this doesn't really need huge amounts of money to be spent on it. It isn't like the orange section where you've got hundreds of vendors and resellers reaching out to sell you technology. These are you know, some of the quick wins that you can do as an organization and um, just following best practice guidelines. So we do a lot of network audits at Technimove. And one thing that I'm always quite surprised about is we find that a lot of VPN tunnels, site to site tunnels are built on ICAV1. And the industry standard is ICAV2. So if you're building your VPN tunnels on ICAV1, you're leaving yourself to weak cryptographic signals, which means that attackers can effectively breach and intercept those site-to-site -site tunnels. So that's something that's really, really pertinent, but can be done very easily and very quickly just by following best practice guidelines. Again, things like SNMP, so Simple Management Network Protocol. A lot of businesses are using SNMP2, where in actual fact, the industry standard is SNMP3. You know, it has more security controls around remote configuration. So simple things, again, like deploying 
the latest versions of frameworks, the latest versions of policies and, and polling technologies can really help a business you know, strengthen their security posture. And um, simple things again, like bastion jump posts and reverse proxies. So one of the, the saddest things that I see in a lot of organizations is that they allow applications and use, or users to access applications via SSH and RDP. And that means that the user is connecting directly to that application server, which means if that user gets compromised, you're opening up your entire application estate to be compromised. And this is where a lot of ransomware attacks happen. So again, building a bastion jump post, which is just effectively a jump box, which is isolated, which means a user has to connect to that jump box. You can then layer things like multi-factor authentication onto that jump box, and you can ensure that it's isolated from your critical infrastructure. Again, using things like reverse proxies, and this is a very big in the industry at the moment where on number 75 on the green section, we talk about zero trust network access. So there is a huge movement towards zero trust architecture. Zero trust at a very base layer means effectively blacklist everything and, and provide several layers of authentication for a user in different areas to ensure that a user may authenticate once, they may get access to a certain portion of the network. They then need further authentication to get access to a particular data set or a particular application. And what we're seeing now is SD-WAN technologies being used as a reverse proxy, and then we use zero trust network access client agents that we will be able to put on a endpoint device. And that then means that the SD-WAN can be used as a reverse proxy, and we can use ZTNA tags, which means the user that has those tags um, loaded onto their workstation has to authenticate several times with a MAC address or their OS type before they can get access to certain applications. You know, things like 69, which is breach response planning. You know, I've had the pleasure or pain of recovering two global businesses from ransomware attacks. And one thing that I, I really noticed was that there was no breach response or incident response plans for both of those businesses. And although they were breached by different attack vectors, ultimately the result was very similar. You know, a, a lot of the IT team, very panicked, very stressed, the C-level team, very panicked, very stressed, you know, war room calls going on, you know, every hour to understand, you know, what the impact of the breach could look like, how are we going to recover from this breach? You know, do we have backups? You know, where are those backups? Are they offsite? Are they corrupted? Do we need to fail over from production to DR? Are we failing over malware to uh, from production to DR? Um, and this, where it, you know, I'll talk about it a little bit in around cyber resilience and, and how you can kind of cater for not only having a breach response plan, but delivering a more resilient architecture outside of production and DR, which is what a lot of businesses currently run. And the last thing I really want to talk about on the green section is something that we've decided to launch, which is called breach attack simulation. So everyone knows pen testing. Everyone knows continuous vulnerability assessments. Um, and pen testing is fantastic. Um, it's usually done once a year by businesses for audit purposes. Best practice says that it should be done twice a year, so bi-yearly, every six months. And then, and then you've got continuous VA scanning, which is a continuous VA scanner that will scan your internal range and pick up what we call CVEs, common vulnerability enumerations. And a lot of these tend to be firmware updates, um, weak cryptographic signals, uh, patching that needs to be done. And patching is extremely important in security, although it doesn't get you know uh, as much highlight as a lot of the shiny technology i've included it as number 11 on the technology area because it is incredibly important so we're each launching breach attack simulations because we want to be able to contextualize and apply things like the mitre attack work framework and the lockheed martin cyber kill chain so it's one thing a business being able to understand those frameworks but how do you contextualize and apply that to everyday business so we're building out breach attack simulations as a ultimate hardening tool that sits alongside things like pen testing and VA scanning. But pen testing, it's a snapshot in time. It very much depends on the skill of the pen tester. They have a limited environment to work with and a lot of the testing is done manually. So it doesn't give you that 360 view. And very similar to um, VA scanning, VA scanning is excellent. You know, it gives you a baseline. It will pick up known threats that are correlated against the global threat databases, but it's only picking up known threats. 
And you can have lots of different problems with VA scanners, depending on how you deploy them, whereby they can actually put a huge load on production environment and also almost grind things to a halt uh, on a production environment, similar to if you accidentally patch a VM or a server during the day, suddenly that takes down that server and that application and you've got downtime and, and loss of business productivity. So one of the reasons that we wanted to do breach attack simulations is that we can do you know, things like pre-exploitation, where we can look at your email gateway, you know, your web gateway, your web application firewall. And we can look at things like post-exploitation in terms of data exfiltration and lateral movement. And when we talk about lateral movement, we're talking about east and west. So traditional data center, north and south, that's traffic in, traffic out. East and west is lateral traffic. And that's usually across your internal infrastructure, applications, databases, domain controllers critical infrastructure. So it's really important to be able to test things like lateral movement. Um, and then we can talk about things like endpoint detection, um, encryption and things like that. So that's a really important service that we're launching to really provide customers with a further hardening tool, but where they can really contextualize and apply the frameworks and go back to their auditors and say, look, you know, not only have we done the standard things that we're expected to do, we've gone way beyond now and we're actually simulating breaches because we're taking that breach will happen mindset. And you can start to then tie in how does a technology work that you've deployed? You know, if we look at a privilege escalation, for example, which is one of the major MITRE attack known attacks, we can attack an endpoint that has an EDR technology on it. We can check if we can breach that endpoint. We can then see if we can escalate our privileges bypassing IAM and PAM tools. And then we can then test if we can laterally move into application estate. So being able to storyboard that attack from start to finish allows us to deliver that intelligence back to the business to say, well, here's the current security controls that you've got in. This is working well, but this needs improving. So that's a really important part of what we're trying to do. The purple section you know, talks about the typical type of attacks. Um, some of these are from the OWASP top 10. And then you've got other things like the man in the middle attack uh, and things like DNS tunneling, uh, GraphQL's attack. So a GraphQL attack is based on a CMS that works on a web application. You can run things like VA scanning as a web tier. That's something that we do at TechniMove so that we're not just pen testing the web app uh, as a point in time. Because if those developers that you're working on that application are working in a CI CD pipeline, continuous integration, continuous development, then they're being able to roll out updates continuously. That could be daily, weekly, monthly, which means as soon as you roll out one of those updates, that state of that platform has completely changed. So being able to do continuous VA scanning and understanding whether your CMS is potentially breachable, it is really important to businesses moving forward. And the blue section is all around DevSecOps, and this ties directly into CICD pipelines and securing CICD pipelines. And if you've heard the word cloud native banded around, which I'm sure you have, uh, it's most likely um, pertinent to applications that are born in the cloud and applications that are have been built ready for the cloud, so they don't have that legacy application stack. And CICD is, is really adopt, accelerating that adoption to cloud. So when we talk about DevSecOps, you know, a lot of people talk about shift left and shift right. Um, and these are security terms that the industry use. At a basic level, shift left is baking security in right at the very outset. So using things like Sneak to scan open source libraries around common weakness enumeration, so CWEs, so that they can start to understand what vulnerabilities exist in the libraries they're going to use before they even start using those libraries. Um, things like policy as code are really important. So we talk about continuous integration, continuous development. But actually, you've got continuous compliance. So policy as code is really important. Again, we use Puppet for something like policy as code that pushes you know, that security and compliance right into the shift left. So don't brute force security controls in at the end. Plan them right at the beginning before you even start testing and start coding, building and testing. And then we talk about shift right, which is that observability. That's allowing the granular analytics and observability of your cloud native applications and CI CD pipelines to understand what tripwires are being set off, what signals can be used for breaches. And so it's really, really important. And then we talk about the resilience side of things. And, and this is where we 
draw that distinction between cyber security and cyber resilience and and backup and dr um, is obviously a huge part of it so a lot of people may have heard the term immutable backups that's a backup that cannot be deleted it cannot be encrypted it cannot be changed either by a member of staff inside a company or a cyber criminal outside a company so we've recently launched a mutable backup as a service platform which is built on veeam which provides immutability to our Zadara Enterprise Storage as a Service Appliance, where we have what we call a SOBA, a scale out backup repository, which is fully immutable. So if we want to talk about cyber resilience, we have to start thinking, well, we need to deliver a completely isolated air gapped platform, which is immutable and has things like file integrity monitoring, um, which is 34 on the technology uh, section, which is the orange section. And that ties directly into HIPAA because actually HIPAA is obviously the, one of the main compliance frameworks for healthcare and file integrity monitoring is actually a, you know, a paramount foundational layer of complying to something like HIPAA. So building a resilient platform that's completely isolated from production and DR that complies with your regulations is critical to being cyber resilient. Yeah, again, abilities business to continue delivering outcomes irrespective of a breach. And that takes us to the end of the talk. Um, again, I appreciate that this has been you know, very high level. So if anyone would like to follow up with me directly after the event for you know, a two or three hour session going into detail into this periodic table and how you know, someone like Technimove can potentially help your business, um, then you can contact me through Giant. And thank you very much for listening to my talk. <laughs>